I'm very, very pleased today to be able to introduce Natalie Batalia. She's a member of the Kepler Mission Science Office at NASA Ames Research Center, but Natalie is also an assistant professor for physics and astronomy at San Jose State. Oh, associate now, well, tell them to update your bio on the website. Um, she's an associate professor for physics and astronomy at San Jose State University. And um, she's been affiliated with NASA Ames Research Center since around 2000. She was an NRC fellow and worked with Bill Baruchi at that time and subsequently was hired by San Jose State, who have loaned her right back to NASA Ames Research Center to work on Kepler. And she will explain to you what she's doing on the project and what kinds of fun things we're all finding out about. Um, she is, like several people, a co-investigator on, on the program. She's also the director of the Systems Teaching Institute at NASA Research Park, which endeavors to bring students to um, Ames Research Center and place them in various positions around the center. Um, she got her bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. After beginning, I believe, as a business major and finding out about the stars and abandoning business for science, we're all really pleased. Um, subsequently, she obtained an MS at the National Observatory, which is here in Portuguese, and I don't speak Portuguese, so I just translated, <laughs> um, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in astrophysics in 1992, and her PhD in astrophysics in 1997 from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And so, without further ado, I'd love to introduce Natalie to you, and I'd also like to say that I've had the pleasure of working with her as a speaker at teacher workshops, and I think that you will enjoy her as much as the teachers have. Thank you. All right, Kepler's first peak. Kepler is not a mission in development anymore. That's, that's amazing to me. Uh, we've been working on it for so long that it's just hard to believe that it's finally actually in ops. Um, and to prove the point, this is an actual star field from the Kepler spacecraft itself. This is from our first light image. So I know everybody's very excited to see some actual data from Kepler. peak. I don't want to get expectations too high. We won't be announcing any uh, Earth planets, Earth-like planets today. We won't even be announcing any new Jupiter-sized planets today. Um, but I should be able to whet your appetite um, for some high-precision photometry. Okay. Um, I don't think I necessarily have to remind this crowd uh, what Kepler's doing. <laughs> We're looking for extrasolar planets. Um, using transit photometry, and the little animation there shows exactly how that works. Um, but one thing I do like to point out is a little kind of thought experiment that Dimitar Sasilov, one of our co-eyes, put forth, which I find really, really useful. And what it does is it shows the ratio of the contrasts. We've got the light contrast ratio, the mass ratios, and the radii ratios between stars and planets. You can see that the light contrast ratio is really, really high, 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 10th. Uh, whereas the mass contrast is a little more manageable, 1,000 to 100,000. Whereas the radius contrast uh, is only 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 2, 10 to 100. Which really speaks to the capability of these different techniques, uh, how easy or difficult they're going to be. The reason that we were able to detect Earth-sized planets orbiting sun-like stars with transit photometry is exactly because of this uh, low contrast ratio but, uh, of the radii. That makes it more, more easy to do. Whereas the most difficult is going to be actually taking an image of a planet uh, because that light contrast <coughs> ratio is so, so large, right? Planets are so dim compared to their stars. This idea of transit photometry Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, just to drive home the point, here on the left I've got an image of the sun, and superimposed on top of that is a black sphere about the size of a Jupiter. It's going to produce a 1% change in brightness. And on the right-hand side I've got a black sphere about the size of an Earth. It looks very much like a sunspot. 
um, even smaller than sunspots actually. And, and that's going to produce um, a change in brightness of one part per 10,000. Uh, so if you had 10,000 100 watt light bulbs, um, you're trying to detect the change just taking one away. Okay. Um, the geometric probability of alignment is going to be something like a half to 10%, depending on where the planet is in the orbit. And that means because of this small probability, we need to observe a lot of stars in order to find those that are edge on and be able to see those transits. Um, it also, oh, oh, and then the high precision is required in order to see this one part per 10,000 change. So in 1971, a, a fellow by the name of, I think, think Rosenblatt, I'm sorry if I got his name wrong, but he is the first one to propose this idea of detecting planets via transit photometry. Um, in 1984, Bill Baruki here at NASA Ames wrote a paper saying that, yeah, that's great, but if you really want to detect an Earth-sized planet using this method, you have to go to space. And that's how Kepler was born, was born out of that idea. And so after many years of work, um, 1992, he submitted his first proposal for such a mission, and it was rejected. And so he went back to the drawing board time and time again, <laughs> four times actually, actually five. Um, and on the fifth time, it was actually finally selected. That was in 2001. So the mission was selected in 2001, um, and it was launched just this year. So you can see that it's a very, very long, arduous journey to get from idea to actual mission. Um, there's, I, I wrote a little bit about the history of this and why each mission was rejected and how it fi was finally successful um, on a blog uh, site called Beyond the Cradle. You can read about that if you're interested. All right, so we need high precision, hence we need a big uh, photon bucket. Here's our, uh, the blank for the, um, actually it's already ground out, for the primary mirror. It's a Schmidt telescope. If you can imagine looking at those people and that round mirror, uncoated mirror, if you can imagine a yardstick there, you can already tell that that primary is a little bit larger than one meter. Um, and when you put the, all of the optics together, inc including the Schmidt corrector, we have a total collecting uh, diameter of just under one meter, about 0.95 meters. All right, so that gives us our precision. Now we need lots of stars. And being astronomers, we all know where to find lots of stars, right? In the plane of the Milky Way. And so your, your eye might not be able to pick it out, but in this snapshot, this region of the Milky Way, we've got the Summer Triangle, um, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. We're not used to seeing so many stars in the sky, so it's hard to pick out. Uh, in our night sky, those would be the only three stars in the sky in that region. Um, so let me help you out. There's Vega, Deneb, and Altair. <laughs> and our Kepler field of view is, um, we like to say, nestled under the wing of the swan Cygnus um, between the stars Deneb and Vega in our summer night sky. In the galaxy, in terms of magnitudes, uh, we are probing a region of space that's nearly in the plane of the galaxy, not quite, about a little less than 10 degrees above the plane of the galaxy. Um, and you can see that we're really searching a very small portion of our galaxy, the, most, uh, the closest of stars being some tens of light years away and the most distant being some thousands of light years away. Um, and we're just skirting between the Orion Spur and the Sagittarius Arm. Um, so we're really looking in kind of a boring region of the Milky Way galaxy, and we did that on purpose. We don't want any young populations in our field of view that, uh, you know, young stars tend to be variable and would muck things up, and we probably wouldn't be able to find Earth-sized planets around them anyway. Um, so we purposely chose a region of the sky that's very boring, very typical. So this mosaic that we see here, this pattern of squares, um, is actually due to the way the CCDs are laid out. And so here's a picture of the, um, the focal plane array, the local detector electronics. Um, so underneath that brass clamp, you can see the uh, about two inch by two inch squares which comprise our CCD modules. Um, and so there are 42 of them um, sandwiched together in pairs and each, each of the modules has two amps on it. So we talk about 84 channels. And collectively, on that square foot of silicon, we've got about 96 million pixels to choose from, okay? It's a very big camera. 
<clears throat> so over those 96 million pixels in this region of the sky that we've selected, there are about four and a half million stars to choose from. These are stars that are cataloged, that we know about. We know their positions, we know their magnitudes. Uh, many of them are drawn from the USNOB catalog. Many of them we've observed ourselves. I'll talk more about that in a second. But our flight segment constraints will allow us not to bring back to Earth all 95 million pixels or 96 million pixels um, and not all four and a half million stars. Rather, we're going to be constrained to bringing back 5.44 million pixels or 170,000 stars. That's our capability. So we really want to cherry pick out of those four and a half million the best stars that are going to yield the most science. And our primary objective is to detect Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of their parent <coughs> stars. So with that in mind, we want to pick, our, pick the best stars. And so we thought really long and hard about this, how we're going to accomplish this. And we tossed around many different ideas. Um, oh, I don't know how that got in there. Um, and, and finally, we settled on a very comprehensive um, multi-year ground-based effort to actually classify every single star in that field of view that is something like 18th magnitude or brighter. And so we accomplished this with a ground-based observatory at Mount Hopkins, 1.2 meter telescope at Mount Hopkins. And we put some Sloan filters. These are pretty broadband filters, which really tie down the temperature of the star quite nicely. And we added a narrowband filter that's very sensitive to gravity, surface gravity diagnostics, which would tell us something about the radius of the star. Are we looking at a normal main sequence star like our sun, or are we looking at an evolved giant? The latter we want to get rid of. All right. Um, so that resulted in a catalog of stellar parameters. We've got surface gravity, effective temperature. We even have a first guess at the metallicity of every star and the reddening of every star. And once you have the surface gravity and the temperature, you can get a ballpark estimate of the stellar radius. That's what we're really after. Okay. This catalog is about to be made public. Um, it's being uh, archived at Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, at the multi-mission archive called MAST. The website is here listed for you on this website, on this slide. Um, and that should become available very, very soon. <coughs> well, once we have these parameters, now we have to select these stars. And we're going to do that in a statistical way by computing a parameter I will call the minimum detectable planet radius. That is, given the properties of this star, how bright it is, what its size is, what's the smallest planet we can detect in a three and a half year mission with a certain SNR. And we compute that for every single star uh, for various semi-major axes. Detectability is, becomes more difficult the further out you get. But of course, we're primarily <coughs> interested in habitable zone planets. So given the stellar properties of every single star, we compute where the habitable zone is expected to be in a very simple-minded way. Um, and then given that semi-major axis, we ask ourselves, what's the smallest planet we'd be able to detect in a three and a half year mission? And we do that for all the stars. And that's what we use to uh, not only select the best stars, and out of that list of four and a half million, there are only something like 250,000 stars that really meet this criteria where we can indeed detect a habitable planet that is rocky, less than about two Earth radii. There are about 250 stars, 250,000 stars that meet that criteria. And we're going to take those and we're going to rank them in order of priority by how small the planet is that we can detect, um, by how bright the object is, and therefore easy to follow up with our ground-based observatories, et cetera. All right? So that's how we choose the bulk of our stars. And this gives a table um, of the kinds of populations that we're looking at, at least in this parameterization, which is magnitude going down the rows and effective temperature going across the column. And so just a couple things to point out. You see that most of our stars, um, the largest number bin, the totals are, are calculated in the last column. So between 15 and 16th magnitude, we've got 60,000 stars of all spectral types. <coughs> and that's the largest bin in terms of magnitude, which makes sense. You have more stars the fainter you go. Um, but, however, if we constrain ourselves to brighter than 14th magnitude, and we look at G dwarfs, 
somewhere here in this column between uh, five and 6,000 degrees, and you add up those columns, you can see that we do have about 20,000 stars we know to be G-type dwarfs already classified, we know that's what they are. If the probability of finding a habitable planet, um, an Earth-sized habitable planet around a G-dwarf is something like a half of a percent, you can see that you still have quite a good detectability. You expect to be able to detect um, many Earth-sized uh, habitable planets, given those kinds of statistics. So this table I'm showing you is for surface gravities greater than or equal to 3.5, a main sequence star typically being something like four to four and a half. So given the uncertainties, this is kind of our main sequence population, but we do include a few um, slightly evolved stars, things more on the subgiant, in the subgiant regime, especially if they're bright, not necessarily in these lower categories. And what this tells us is that even for subgiants or stars on the bottom of the red giant branch, we <coughs> do expect to be able to find terrestrial sized planets. Um, so that's quite exciting as well. You can fold all of those numbers with the probabilities, the geometric probabilities, and get some ideas to how many planets you we expect to find. Um, and this is a very complicated graph to digest, but the bottom line is that we expect several hundred terrestrial-sized planets in the habitable zones, if indeed they are common, if all the stars have one. And several thousand Earth-sized planets should be detected, detected outside the habitable zone. All right, uh, so this year we saw the launch. At the beginning of the year, we watched with bated breath as they drove the spacecraft all the way across the country from Colorado to Florida. Um, there was this great picture of this big Mack truck pulling into to Cape Canaveral holding the telescope, and we all breathed a sigh of relief when it finally arrived there, and I felt really sorry for the guy that had to drive that all the way across the country. Um, another couple bated breath moments for me um, one, of course, when they take that spacecraft, they package it up and they have to stack it on top of the rocket. That looked really scary to me. I don't know how safe you feel looking at that on the crane. Um, and then the other one, of course, on the left, I'm showing the spacecraft itself, about the size of a small minivan, um, nested inside of the cocoon, which is the rocket fairing. And as some of you might know, the week before we were scheduled to launch, there was a Saturn rocket that had a... a uh, catastrophic failure with a release mechanism on its fairings. So all of our tickets were already purchased. We were practically on the airplane by that time when this happened and we were quite nervous there in Florida waiting to hear what was going to happen as the various review teams went through all the millions of parts that these spacecrafts uh, have in common to see if that fairing might have shared some common part that would give risk to our launch. Um, but fortunately, everything went as expected. I think we ended up to be delayed one or two days, um, and so we were all still there, and we all got to enjoy this absolutely beautiful night launch um, in Florida that many of us in the science office have likened to giving birth. Even my male colleagues have likened it to that. <laughs> I think that was um, John's message to me on my cell phone the night after the launch. I haven't seen anything so beautiful since my wedding or something like that. <laughs> it was really quite exciting. Um, okay, so that was March 6th. Now, after March 6th, we started a uh, approximately 60-day commissioning period to test out the electronics make sure that once it's been blown into space that everything is still functioning as we expect. Um, the spacecraft itself, uh, once it was inserted into its uh, position, we still had a dust cover on it, so it wasn't exposed to light. Our camera doesn't have a shutter. It's always exposed to photons. So we launched it with this uh, cover on it, not only to protect the electronics, uh, but also to be able to do some key calibrations once the spacecraft got into orbit. Um, so, oh, sorry, how could I forget that? <laughs> this is champagne at last. I just love this picture of Bill enjoying his champagne and Dave Koch, the deputy principal investigator behind him, um, celebrating. That was the night after the launch. Stupid us, the one thing we didn't foresee was that in Florida they have bar laws, they gotta close down at 2 a.m. <laughs> that was a big disappointment, but we did sneak in a couple glasses. <laughs> All right, so we blew the dust cover and took our first light image on April 8th. This is during the commissioning period. 
Um, we all sat in the uh, conference room over in building 244 at Ames, and you know, you don't have a, a camera uh, trained on the spacecraft to see, to be able to see the uh, dust cover eject. However, we did have several diagnostics on the screen, for instance, the fine guidance sensors. Um, and as soon as they are exposed to starlight, we see them start to twinkle. We see the numbers register. So that was another very, very exciting moment for us when that dust cover was blown. And then, of course, when we got down the first light image a couple of days later, um, to see the stars in such, so close to optimal focus, um, with everything just looking exactly like you'd expected. You know, for years we've been looking at simulated images, and you just couldn't tell the difference between the simulated images and this. It was really something. Um, so this doesn't do it justice. Um, with 96 million pixels, this image, you can't get a feel for the resolution. We've got the two blow-ups on the top, um, one showing Trace 2, which is one of the known transiting exoplanets in our field of view, and another showing NGC 6791, which is an open cluster in our field of view. Very important open cluster that we'll be using to calibrate the ages of the stars that have planets around them. Um, also during the commissioning period, now that we're seeing light, we've got actual stars, we want to characterize our point spread function, or what I've termed PRF here, pixel response function, is that what it stands for, John? Um, quite carefully, and here's two examples, um, a nice sharp PSF in the middle of the focal plane, you've got some extended wings on the outside of the plane, and the reason I'm showing this is because this is the kind of information that we use to simulate the images and to simulate the data that we're going to get down. And to drive home that point, I've got this slide, um, which was produced by Mike Haas, which is a comparison of s a simulated image on the right with an actual image on the left. This is a tiny little postage stamp, okay? Now, your eye says, okay, great, yeah, we've got one, two, three, four stars, big deal. But look at the pixel level. Look at the grayscale. Look how well they match. I mean, down to this, you know, detailed gray structure here, you see that the brightness is very well reproduced. And so it's this kind of simulated data that we use to select the, pi the pixels that we're all actually going to transmit down to Earth. We're going to make these kind of cookie cutters to punch out certain pixels of interest and send those down to Earth um, to analyze on the ground. Um, this kind of data also allows us to compute the amount of crowding that we expect from neighboring stars. You know, if we're going to pick this as a target star, we want to know how much of the flux from that guy is going to be contaminating that aperture. That's something called crowding, and, and we do that as well. All right, so that's the commissioning period. That's kind of the overview. Um, and now I go into the sneak peek part of the talk. Um, the sneak peek is going to be based on 10 days of commissioning data. After we defined those pixel uh, response functions really well, uh, we took 10 days of data that, that we expect to be uh, exactly like our ops data. Um, uh, so that lasted 10 days, and then we went into ops around the beginning, the first or second week of May, and we took 33 days of, uh, a little over 33 days of our first operations data, our first science data. Uh, what we refer to as quarter one. Um, and in the following, all of the data I'm going to show you um, is 30-minute samples. So they're actually co-ads um, that give us a 30-minute sample. So in bullets, these are the things I'd like to show you. Um, first, we did an analysis uh, comparing the characteristics at this high precision of giant stars versus dwarfs. How many of our stars, of our star sample, how much is it contaminated by giants? that we just erroneously classified. Um, I'm going to show you some interesting variable stars. And then something that sounds boring, but actually was really interesting to me, something I was very excited to see. What does our typical G-type star look like? When I was a graduate student, there were murmurings that our sun was somehow special, uh, that our sun was maybe more stable than other stars its age and its type. And that has serious implications for life in the universe, right? If most G-type stars are quite variable, then the chance for life to evolve is going to be that much slimmer. So is the sun typical, or is it somehow special? That's something that we didn't know yet. 
Um, and then I'm going to show you one of the known transiting planets in our field of view. And then I'd like to talk, if there's time, a little bit about the work that we've done, the progress that we've made in confirming planets. Again, I'm not going to show any actual planet detections. I'm not going to announce any detections, but I'll show you how we're making our way there. All right. So the title of this slide, slide is The Reliability of the Kick. And I guess I haven't defined what Kick is, but it stands for the Kepler Input Catalog. This is the big catalog of ground-based stellar classification that's being archived at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And we want to know how reliable it is. So on the left-hand side, I have an actual light curve. Um, this is from the commissioning data, so it's about 10 days long. An actual light curve of a dwarf a main sequence star. And on the right hand side I have a light curve of a typical giant. Uh, and below each light curve in the lower panel is their uh, Fourier spectrum, the power spectrum, that shows what those variab that variability looks like in frequency space. Um, okay, so a couple things to notice. First of all, the y-axis you probably can't see, but here it's uh, 0 .0004, 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Whereas over here for giants, it's 2 times 10 to the minus 3. So it's about an order of magnitude different. So first thing we notice is that giants tend to be more variable than dwarfs. Okay. Um, with regards to the power spectrum, you can already see that this is going up and down and up and down and up and down quite rapidly, and that's not noise. It's, those are actual variations on short time scales. Um, so the power spectrum of the late type dwarf has a lot of energy down here, but also you see this really broad envelope. You see power at all frequencies, at least all the frequencies that we can probe with this 10-day time series. Whereas the red giants, in a 10-day time series at least, the power spectrum looks quite different. You've got a lot of energy. It's not completely harmonic, but you've got a lot of energy in a rather narrow frequency band that's something like 10 to 40 hours. And then the rest of the power spectrum is, quite qu is relatively quiet, right? Which you can see by eye. You don't have this up and down stuff that you do for the dwarf. So we use both pieces of information, both frequency space and the temporal domain, um, in, in terms of the amplitude of variability, in order to figure out what's what. Which is an amazing thing that's never been done before, right? To actually classify a star just based on its photometric variability. But now with this precision, that's the kind of science that we can do. So we have two control samples, a thousand stars that we know because of parallax and other ancillary information, maybe spectroscopy. We know our giants and the same for the dwarfs. Um, and we use that control sample to quantify these uh, various statistics. So here I've got a plot of the noise, uh, the RMS divided by what you would expect from the noise models, just your instrument plus shot noise, um, for the dwarfs and the giants. And you can see for the giants, there's this big white empty space on the bottom. There are no giants in that bottom regime where the amplitudes of variability are very low. All the giants seem to be quite uh, active. Uh, the dwarfs tend to cluster around the low amplitudes, but you can see that there's a large contamination up here as well something we have to be worried about. And these bottom diagrams really just summarize in a quantitative way that same information um, at a ratio of 2.5 and below. You've got 61% of the dwarfs fall below that envelope. It's very, very quiet out here. And then you've got this smattering of 19% greater than 10. And it's the converse for the giants, right? Giants are the other way around. Essentially, everything is above 2.5. Um, nothing below. Where's the sun on that picture? Right? Um, that's a really good question. I'm hesitant to answer that on uh, with exactly these characteristics, the ten days and the way that it's been. I don't know. Um, and I'll speak more about that in a second. Of those high amplitude dwarfs, we inspected all of those by hand, and we found that many of them were binaries. So here's a contact binary. 9% of them were binaries. 5% were other eclipsing binaries. Um, <coughs> some of them are classical oscillators, like the gamma Doradus variables that occur around the F, um, late A, early F type stars. 
Um, we've got gamma Doradus variables there. They are main sequence, but they're variable. They oscillate. And then here we've got other. Um, this light curve is a M star, a flaring M star. And the kind of variability that you see there is, is quite typical of the M stars. All right. So scanning through these 1,000 uh, star control samples, um, we conclude the following. Um, of the red giant light curves, none seem to be likely to be dwarfs based on their variability information. Um, if the kick claims it's a giant, it almost certainly is. And manual inspection of the high variance dwarfs yields only about a two, per five, two to five percent error rate. And again, we looked at all these light curves by hand, these ones that were in that high amplitude bin. Um, so that speaks to the reliability of the kick. If it's a giant, it almost certainly is. If it's a main sequence star, you'd expect a two to five percent error rate, misclassification rate, which is astounding. That s completely exceeded our expectations. I had, f I had completely expected there to be something on the order of a 20% error in the kick error rate. So this was just extremely good news. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Okay, some interesting variables. You've seen a couple already. This is an eclipsing binary star. Um, I've got the full light curve on the top and the folded light curve on the bottom, including a zoom in the y-axis in the red. This graph was produced by um, Doug Caldwell for an IAU talk he gave a couple weeks ago. We have some participating scientists that are interested in eclipsing binaries, and we sent a light curve to um, a couple of them shortly after commissioning. And I should have reprinted the email uh, on this pre for this presentation, but the email that I got back from our participating scientists was, oh, Natalie, that's great, that's lovely, but could you please send me the unsmooth data? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really looks like you drew this with a Sharpie, right? I mean, where's the noise? You just don't see it until you zoom in. Um, all right, so we've got um, our primary eclipse here. Here's the secondary eclipse. It's, it's this little notch here. The up and down and up and down you see is probably some kind of an ellipsoidal variation because they're so close. This is a very short period system. And so you've got perturbations in the shape of the star. It's not perfectly spherical. And as it rotates, you see the changing projected area. And so that causes the light output to go up and down. Um, what's interesting though, well at least to me, and I'm no expert, but usually these ellipsoidal variations are very much in phase with the transits. And here you see this primary transit that's a little bit out of phase. Um, so this will be a very interesting case study. Here's another one, slightly different. This is more of a contact system. Um, and again, I've got the full light curve and then a folded light curve here on the bottom. And the size of the symbol is larger than the noise in that folded light curve. And, and, and as illustrated on the top, right? It just looks like beads on a string. What's going on down there? Uh, that's an artifact of detrending. It's not, it's not a real signal. <coughs> Um, RR Lyrae type variables, these are, well, we know what RR Lyrae type stars are. They're used in the distance scale um, in order to get distances to globular clusters, for example. They're pulsating stars that have a certain period that's tied to their <coughs> luminosity. And so if we know the period, we know the luminosity. If we know the luminosity, we know the distance to the source. Um, great. Well, we have some in the field, too. Most of them get thrown away for our science ops data because we're purposely excluding giants. Um, but some of them sneak through. This is uh, from quarter one data. This is an example. The RR Lyrae's lie, on, they're in the instability strip, but they actually lie quite close to the main sequence uh, for those earlier type stars. Um, so they do get picked up in our sample. Um, so you see the very characteristic variability of the RR Lyrae, the rapid rise and then the slow um, fall of that light output um, as this star pulsates. So here's a really noisy light curve, right? No, it's not noisy. Those up and down and up and down you see are actually pulsations. Um, so here are the, here's a little segment blown up, and here it is in frequency space. Um, so you have 2% peak-to-peak -peak variations, and the periodogram gives these nice peaks um, at 75 and 74 minutes. Um, so some kind of a pulsation for this star, for these short period variables. And we see a lot of these. Um, many of them are very beautiful. 
as they have multiple frequencies that beat together and so you get these really lovely patterns. All right, but what about the normal stars, right? I mean, after all, this is a mission to look at typical sun-like stars. Um, so what I did was I took uh, the brightest 20 stars, tw the brightest 20 G-type stars, and I'm going to show you those, the brightest 20 K-type stars, and the brightest 20 M-type stars, just to get a feel for what's there. And I did no, I just blindly picked the brightest 20, all right? So here's our G-dwarfs. <laughs> Pretty boring. Okay, fine. The scale is plus or minus 1%, so that's actually a very big scale. Um, most of them are just flat on the scale. You don't really see any structure at all. A few interesting things. You've got, this is an eclipsing binary here. Um, you know, you've got something that might look like a gamma door type variable. Um, some stars, this is probably, um, well, I won't, that actually looks like a, almost a contact binary. You see these two dips are, are the same, and it looks like this one's coming back. Um, some active stars, this could be a very active star, young. We do expect about 25% of the stars in the field to be young, right? So, so we do expect a lot of magnetic activity to make its appearance in at least 25% of the stars. Sorry, what's the horizontal axis? Time, or days. days. Yeah, that's about 33 days of data from quarter one. Okay, so these are, st like I said, the brightest stars, so these are between 7th and 9th magnitude. And if you apply just a simple median filter to get rid of all of the uh, low frequency variations and focus on the RMS of the high frequency or the time scales that we're interested in, you end up finding a variability of 4 to 15 parts per million for this sample, which speaks to the precision. And for a 12th magnitude G dwarf, we expect something like 20 something, right John? So this is also very good news. We are achieving the precision that we, that we expect. All right, the K dwarfs. Now K dwarfs, you know, our convection zones are getting deeper. We expect to have more magnetic activity, right? So you expect a lot more variability for K dwarfs. Do we get it? Yeah, okay, sure, maybe here. Right? Spots going in and out of view. Spots over there. But yet, there are still some very, very quiet K-dwarfs. This was a big surprise to me. These are 9.5 to 11th magnitude. Of course, our brightest K-dwarfs are going to be a little fainter because they are intrinsically more faint. Um, but again, we've got uh, precision uh, on 6.5 hour time scales. So this has been to 6.5 hours. After applying a filter, uh, we get 4 to 20 parts per million for this sample. That's an eclipsing binary, a very short period eclipsing binary. Yeah. <laughs> okay, M dwarfs. You want to see M dwarfs? Oh, burn my eyes. <laughs> Okay, again, convection zones are getting deeper. You expect more magnetic activity. Um, the good news is, despite all of this variability, M dwarfs are small. Transits of terrestrial planets are going to be deeper and therefore easier to detect. M dwarfs are cool, so their habitable zones are, are close in. So we expect lots of transits, lots of deeper transits, um, for a terrestrial-sized planet in the habitable zone, which and the transit durations are going to be shorter themselves. So even though you've got variability on time scales that are beginning to encroach down on days, a day's time scale, the transit durations themselves are going to be shorter, they're going to be deeper, and they're going to be more frequent, so they're going to be easier to detect. To detect. So even given this variability for the M dwarfs, we fully expect to be able to detect terrestrial-sized planets. Okay, now, well, I haven't really answered the question, is the sun typical, right? So let me show you a plot of just three of these random G dwarfs in comparison with the SOHO data of our own sun. Can you tell which one is the sun? <laughs> this is the active sun, maybe that's not quite so fair. Let's do the quiet sun. Three more Kepler light curves of G dwarfs contrasted with the quiet sun. Which one is the sun? 
this, this really excites me. I don't, I don't know why this excites me so much, but, but the sun is typical. It appears in this very small statistics, in these very small numbers I'm presenting, that the sun is indeed going to be typical, and that's thrilling. All right? Okay. Um, let's talk about a known transiting planet. There was announcement um, beginning of August, first week of August, Kepler published its first science result in Science Magazine on the known transiting planet Hat P7b. Um, so Hat P7b is, as you can see from this diagram, a rather massive short period planet, so it's a hot Jupiter. Um, and here are its characteristics about 320 parsecs away, it's relatively bright. Um, the star itself is hotter and therefore more massive than the sun. Um, the planet itself, denoted by the little b, is about 1.8 Jupiter masses. It's very close in, period of something like 2.2 days and a radius of 1.4 Jupiter radii. There were three, there were three known transiting planets in our field of view that we purposely put on our target list. We're observing all three of them. And so you can imagine, as soon as we got down the commissioning data, one of the very first things that we did, John did, was to uh, look at the light curve of these three known transiting planets. And that's what we saw. Um, on the top are the ground-based measurements from Paladal 2008, and on the bottom panel we've got Kepler's measurements uh, just from the 10 days of commissioning data. Sampled at 30 minutes and folded to the orbital period. That's why you end up with some, uh, you know, well actually there are no gaps. That's probably due to the slope. Um, Okay, well that's the, that's the transit, you know, it's, it's a pretty big object, so it, the transit depth is something like 1%. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. When we zoom in a little bit, we can start to see the noise, um, but then immediately your eye sees that. And if you zoom in even more, and you're not dominated by the size of the symbol, um, your transit, of course, goes, your primary transit goes off scale, and then you start to see what appeared to be a secondary transit, or perhaps more correctly, uh, we should refer to it as an occultation of the planet as it passes behind the parent star. Um, okay, so this is a hundred times magnification and we've purposely left off a Y scale here. I'll get to that in a second. Um, before I do, let's just look a little bit at the model. Of course, this is only based on 10 days of commissioning data, so our, our models are, uh, going to improve with time. So you're seeing here two things. You're seeing a phase variation that looks like, we were referring to it as reflected light, right? As the planet comes in and out of view, as it rotates, you see different projected area of illumination being reflected from the star itself, right? Kind of like a moon in its orbit. Um, the problem is that the shape of that, of that curve, combined with the depth of the occultation event, is not exactly right for pure reflection. And it's not what we expected anyway. These hot Jupiters are all thought to have very low albedos. So we don't expect it to be very reflective at all. And so this illumination that you're seeing, this radiation that you're seeing, um, as it approaches that far side, is not so much reflected light as it is thermal emission from the day side of the planet itself. Right? So you've got this asymmetric distribution of radiation temperature between the day side and the night side, and that's causing this asymmetric radiation. So if you model that um, and you assume a completely absorbing atmosphere for the planet, you end up uh, with a prediction of the day side temperature of this planet of 2650 Kelvin. That's like an M dwarf, right? <laughs> just the surface. It doesn't speak to what's going on inside of the object, but its surface on the day side is approaching that of an M dwarf. Okay, but we're going we're gonna to flex our muscles here a little bit, and I'm going to brag a little bit here, because what's really exciting about this detection is this Y scale. Because this little event here that we got from 10 days of commissioning data has an amplitude of just 130 parts per million. An Earth around a Sun is going to be something like 84, 80-something parts per million. And that's an 11 sigma detection. 
with coincidentally four events. We've got four of these folded together, which is what we expect for our Earth-Sun analog as well. Um, so if I scale this to 84 parts per million, you get something like 7.3 sigma, which is exactly what we expect for stars of a certain magnitude. So that's why I call this flexing our muscles, because this shows, this demonstrates capability. I mean, we knew that we were getting the precision that we needed, but this shows that we're able to, not just with the precision that we get, but with the whole entire pipeline, we are able to recover photometry, light curves, um, with the precision that we need to find these kinds of events. Okay, so let me move a little bit to um, confirming planets. Of course, we've seen a lot of interesting things in our data um, that once the data comes down and we detect these events, now you actually have to confirm them because as, as you probably know, the transit, tec transit technique has a very high false uh, detection statistic associated with it. There are a lot of false positives and we need to vet them out. That is, there are a lot of astrophysical signatures out there that mimic a transit of a planet around a star and we need to be able to separate them out. And so that's a very lengthy process that involves many, many teams of ground-based observers. Once we go, once we have that photometry and that detection, we spend the whole subsequent observing season or even longer to actually confirm it. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that procedure. Um, there's, it kind of breaks up into two pieces. The first we call data validation. Um, that's stuff that we do only with the photometry. There are ways that we can vet out the false positives only with the photometry. Um, we look at what's statistically significant. We model the light curves and see if they're consistent with planets. And then we have this false positive elimination that I'm going to talk about. And then if it passes that first cut, it goes to our follow-up observation program, which is our ground-based observers doing spectroscopy on the ground, both at moderate precision and very high precision, in order to confirm the planet, but also to characterize it, if possible, by looking at the radial velocity modulations and actually computing a mass. Okay. Well, the game that we're playing is really, really different than the game we were playing when we were doing ground-based transit surveys. Um, we had all a whole slew of false positives before with the ground-based programs like Vulcan, our test bed before Kepler, that we just don't even have to deal with anymore. And a case in point is FM binaries. An M star is about the same radius as a Jupiter. And if you put it around an F-type star, it produces a transit signature that looks like a Jupiter around an F-star, right? Um, and so typically we would have to go out and take spectroscopy in order to see the big Doppler shift due to the M-dwarf to be able to say it wasn't a planet. We don't even have to deal with that anymore. Why? Because we have such high precision that when the M-dwarf goes behind the star, we see the secondary eclipse now, something that we couldn't see from the ground. And this is a good example. So here's the raw light curve. This is the 33 days of quarter one data. Um, here it is folded. Here's our primary transit signature. And then we look at exactly 0.5 phase. Um, and we model a secondary transit. And we report the uh, significance of that detection. And in this case, it was 29 sigma. Way, way too deep to be. Um, the kind of secondary transit that we saw from HAP P7. So we immediately know, simply from photometry, without having to do any spectroscopy, that this is an FM binary. Um, another thing we usually had to worry about um, were grazing events, you know, where you had two objects, and instead of having a central transit, it just kind of nipped the bottom of that star, thereby depleting the right percentage of light when you actually had two stars. Um, another kind of false positive is dilution, where instead of having a star like the Sun with a Jupiter, you've got a binary system and a third star diluting it. So this kind of a statistical test helps us to sort out these kinds of problems to some degree. And this is what we call the odd-even effect. So here um, we've got the raw light curve. Here it is again folded. And what we've done is we've labeled the transits with different symbols depending on whether they were in 
transit number 1357, et cetera, versus 246810. And so here you can see that the transits, um, the odd versus the even transits, have statistically significant different, uh, different depths. And that's at a 17 sigma, um, at the 17 sigma level. So this is an indication that what we're seeing is not just a transit event at this period, but actually a primary and a secondary at double the period, which is indicative of a binary system. Here's a case where the model looks really good, actually. The secondary eclipse statistic and the odd-even statistic is actually great, but um, there's another kind of false positive. Here I've got... Um, two images of the same star field. This is from the digitized sky survey, and this is actually from the Vulcan ground-based survey, which has approximately the same pixel sizes that Kepler has. And you can see that due to the very uh, significantly much lower spatial uh, resolution, all of this complex structure here, all of these stars in this field are all just kind of smeared together. And that's a problem for us because you have this effect of dilution. And this is kind of a simple mathematical example. Let's say you have a transiting event, and I've given some numbers to the actual flux value, some pretend numbers that we measure. Let's say we had a flux of 1,000 here, and then it dimmed to 90% of that value. Well, let's say instead what you actually had, now, oh, first I should go down to here. Let's divide all of this by 1,000, just normalize the light curve, and you end up with 1 here and 0.9 here. Got a 10% transit, right? But instead of that, let's say that you were actually looking at the sum of two systems. Let's say you had a background star that was contributing 500 units of flux. When you add that together, you get this. And when you divide, those two, divide that by 1,500 to normalize the spectrum, you end up giving, or the light curve, you end up getting a transit depth of 0.933. That is, your transit got shallower. And this is dilution from background objects. So, I could change this around a little bit to say, well, let's say you had a star that had nothing going on, and you had a very faint system someplace aligned with it that was an eclipsing binary system that had like a 50% transit depth, but when you added everything up together, it looked like a 1% transit because of this dilution. And we call that kind of a false positive of background eclipsing binary, something that we have to work uh, very hard to understand. So fortunately, um, what we do is with Kepler is we measure something called the photocenter. It's kind of like a center of mass, but it's the center of the light distribution as a function of time um, for this distribution of fluxes and positions. And so if this object, for instance, was the object in the background doing the eclipsing, when it eclipses and gets dimmer, the photocenter should shift accordingly, right? That center of mass of that distribution is going to shift. And so we look at these centroid time series in order to be able to disentangle if we have a black background eclipsing binary or not. And here's an example of one that does not have one. Here is a light curve. You see the nice transits. And here is the centroid time series for the rows, the row values, the x position, and the y value, the y position. And there's nothing obvious here that aligns with these transits, OK? This is another way of looking at the same thing. This is what we call a rain cloud plot or a cloud rain plot. Here I've got that same centroid shift on the x-axis, both for columns and rows. Columns are blue, rows are green. And on the y-axis, I have the flux in the light curve. So when it transits, those points are going to cluster down here. And this is, these are all the out of transit points. So this cloud up here shows you what the mean flux level is and what the centroids are doing on average and what their dispersion is. And this is what we'd call the rain. The rain shows us that it just fell down, just precipitated out, and didn't blow around. Right? The object transited, but the centroids didn't move. A cloud rain plot. Now here's a star for which we see a very marked signature in the rho centroid time series. And you see it lines up exactly with the transits. Nothing too, well I guess there is a signature in the columns as well. It's going to be a 
some of both. And here's what its rain cloud plot looks like. It's a hurricane, <laughs> right? Cloud rain and lots of wind as you see these centroids sweep over. So this is a telltale signature that that object, whose photometry looked great, right, had no signatures of anything weird going on, is actually due to a background eclipsing binary. And so we're able to vet those out that way as well. Once we know of a system like that, um, and again, this is the system I'm speaking of, we can take the um, images, the postage stamps, when the star was transiting or when that object was transiting, put them in one drawer and take the postage stamps when the star was not transiting and put them in another drawer and average them together and take a difference. And this is the difference here. These postage stamps, these are just copies of one another, just showing the direct image. So this is what the star looked like. Okay, the brightest pixel was here. Here are the brightest pixels and you go up here and that's where they are here. And then if you do the same thing for, for rows, here's the brightest pixels and you go over here. Well, what's that? When you take the difference, you quickly see that the brightest pixel contributing to the difference is someplace way off in Australia. So now you look at the pixel time series of these individual pixels. So here's the flux time series of just that one pixel. No photometry, nothing complicated, just the straight time series. And where's the transit? There's nothing. But you look at the time series of that pixel way up there and you plot it. Ah, not only is the transit there, it's deeper now because you have less dilution because you excluded all the other pixels. So now not only can we tell that it is indeed a background eclipsing binary, now we can tell which object in, in the galaxy is the one that's actually the binary. And we can start to observe that if we're so inclined. All right, so my summary is uh, we've got a list of about 150,000 stars. Um, they comprise a prioritized exoplanet target list that works to maximize our science yield. Um, stars as quiet as the sun seem to be common, if you believe statistics of 20. Um, <coughs> about 20,000 stars are G dwarfs brighter than 14th magnitude, and the reason I picked that magnitude is because that seems to be the limit for our ground-based observers using the Keck Observatory, for example the limit to what they can follow up on. That's a lot of nice stars to choose from. Um, the pre-selection of the targets and the high precision that we are achieving significantly reduce the burden of the follow-up observers. When we were working on ground-based surveys, our, our spectroscopists experience told them that for every 60 stars they had to observe, they made one detection. Corot is saying something like maybe six to one. Our, our, false, po our false positive detection rate is, is uh, playing out to be significantly smaller than that as a result of this work. And then finally, our instrument is yielding um, very good precision, um, perfectly capable of detecting Earth-sized planets around habitable stars. So I will leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> A few questions. I'd like you to use the microphone because we're recording this and your questions will also be recorded. So who would like to ask a question? Pierre? Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of the talk you talked about um, uh, parallax. Uh, uh, you used the parallax. Uh, how, how many kiloparsec at how many or can you actually use parallax? When I said we're using parallax, I just mean no, no, if, if a parallax measurement existed in the literature, we made use of it for classification Indeed, purposes. Indeed, but uh, you are looking at up to 6,000 light years, something uh, like, like this? Like 3,000. 3,000. So how many, uh, how far can you actually use parallax to, um, not you, but they before? Oh, from the survey. Oh, the, the parallaxes we get are just from Hipparchos. So that's a function of, um, let's see, it's a function of how close it is and the magnitude. It's a convolution, but it's, it's relatively complete, only down to like ninth magnitude or something. It's, it's really the closest of I think stars. He's asking how, how far can you use parallax to measure the distance to something? Right. Just the fundamental. How far out does parallax work for us? With which instrument? Well, any. Any instrument. 
And how far out can how far out did that? Oh satellite yeah, measure? Hipparco, the Hipparco satellite uh, again. It's only to like ninth magnitude. So the stars that it's measuring distances for are probably some hundreds of parsecs away or yeah, hundreds of light years away. They're very close. very short. Oh yeah, very absolutely. Close. It's a very small number of stars uh, that we have parallaxes for. And um, um, yes, you mentioned the gravity at the surface. Yeah. That that left me conf confounded. How do you measure the gravity at the surface of a star Through without having uh, orbiting objects? Uh, the surface gravity is, um, affects certain spectral di diagnostics. So there are lines in the spectrum that are sensitive to pressure, and they broaden due to pressure. So if you have a very high surface gravity, you have more pressure, therefore more pressure broadening. And so like magnesium B lines, for example, are very sensitive to pressure. So if you can design a filter that's in the wing of one of those lines, mm. you can ascertain something about the gravity. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So when can we expect the first science paper with the observations of exoplanets? Well, we just had one. <laughs> <laughs> Are you complaining? <laughs> um, January. Uh, Natalie, this is very elegant and, and beautiful stuff. I think you guys really uh, should be congratulated on this. Um, <laughs> So I remember early on in the game, uh, Bill was talking about improving the photometric precision by defocusing the mm. optics a little bit. And it seems like you haven't done that. Mm. And I can see the advantage of that in terms of the centroiding and all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. there was a worry at some point that even intra-pixel variation was going to introduce some noise. Have, is that not gone away, or, or why did you decide not to defocus? I think it, it has to do with the techniques that we're using. The fact that we could, uh, during the commissioning period, use, do these dithering measurements in order to map out the pixel response function at the sub-pixel level um, helps us to do that. Um, there is also detrending that's built into the pipeline in order to look at the motion and try to detrend it out. But yeah, the photometric precision, I mean, that didn't pan out. It, we did extensive tests with that with Vulcan, too, to try and get higher precision by defocusing. It, we, we never found that to be the case. So. Any other questions? Um, what kind of support do you expect from the ground? Um, you mentioned, for instance, that the Keck Observatory is able to take, uh, to observe Start with magnitude 14. I think as you mentioned, you mean here that the high resolution spectra will be recordable with the Keck for star up to magnitude 14. So, what kind of other support are you expecting, for instance? Uh, other support? Yeah. From other ground. types of observations? Yeah. As soon as you get the detection of a possible transit planet, mm -hmm. uh, what, what else do you, will you need, for instance, to characterize the planet? Uh, to characterize the planet, what we'd that. like to have is a radial velocity curve. Uh, that will give us the mass. And now, that, and then when we have the radius from the photometry and the mass from the spectroscopy, you can measure things like density, the average density, and whatnot. Um, that's not going to be possible with all of the stars. For a true Earth-Sun analog, we don't expect with current ground-based technology to be able to get an orbital velocity solution uh, to really see those amplitudes change uh, because they're predicted to be so small. Um, and we know what the precision is that we can get from our spectroscopy. Um, so for those cases, what we'll do is eliminate all the possible false positives in order to confirm that planet, but we won't be able to characterize it um, uniquely. Um, but other ground-based observations that we're doing, for instance, we have a couple team members that are working with adaptive optics in order to really see at very high spatial resolution what is in the galaxy in that postage stamp so that we can, uh, even for, you know, like an Earth, when, when you're really trying to say, this is an Earth-Sun analog, you have to rule out all the false positives. And if you have an object, very faint, and it can be like 19th magnitude, 20th magnitude, um, in that aperture, lined up with your target star, that can confound you. So adaptive optics will help us to probe that sub-pixel region to be able to see what's, what's there. Okay. I wanted to hear you saying the word adaptive optics. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, okay. There is uh, the, uh, what I'm going to talk about was the possibility of using photometric data that wasn't intended to be used as photometric data. And for instance, uh, I'm familiar with the uh, 
Gravity Probe B had a very good guide, quote unquote, guide star oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. telescope on it. And it had data for, very reliable data, very, very accurate data for a year or more. Mm -hmm. Could you, for, for this mission or for future missions, could you find the old data or for future missions, log the old data from the guide star telescopes of other missions and then look at the same stars with Kepler or the subsequent missions to Kepler. Use that for calibration. You'll have a, a longer period of observation on a single star in a uh, space environment. I, so I think you're, you're asking about the data you, you that's look on, at the the same star. on the fine guidance sensors? Is, yeah, is that yeah. what you're asking about? The same about? stars that were looked at guidance sensors. Um, well, I think we have like four or five stars on each, or 20, five to 20, so yeah. 10 per fine guidance sensor. And they are observed. I mean, there's nothing particular about that data that would be more compelling than the data that we're taking with our science instrument. Well, your question was for us uh, to look at other stars that have been seen by other space-based telescopes. Yeah. With, so, it, it, right, for example, it, PB7 was, or 7B was a known transiting planet in our field of view. Are there other stars that have really good photometry from other That we could look at with our, with our instruments. The fine guidance sensors are also pointing at our field of view. And we're not moving the telescope to probe other areas of the sky. So there's, yeah. Yeah, Kepler is going to point yeah. at the same place. Exactly. Always. Okay, well, I want to again thank Natalie for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.